Manor Lords hits early access on the 26th, and with it, the floodgates will open to over 2 million people who have the game on their wish list right now. But with all the coverage coming out from creators such as myself, the question pops up, is the game worth the hype? Is it even interesting? In this video today, I want to show off some of the game's mechanics, talk about how this is rapidly becoming one of my favorite hybrid games, combining the elements of survival city builders like Frostpunk and the interactive rank and file commands of, say, a banner lord. If this is your first time on my channel, the way I do things is by upfronting the knowledge in my videos so you can decide if it's the right one for you. With that being said, I think the game truly does live up to the hype. Initially, when you boot up, you're dealt a ton of customization options, and from there, the game starts to snowball. It's subtle at first, setting up basic storage for your supplies, figuring out your food income, but once you start to get into the nuance of systems such as marketplaces and balancing your workers across the many jobs available to them, it becomes a game of constantly trying to fine-tune little dials to get your medieval society kicking in all cylinders. Then, you unlock the castle planner, and you start filling your RGB gaming diaper like I did. And then you start customizing elements of your retinue that comes from the aforementioned castle. The game just has so many fun nested systems that are trickled in at just the right pace that you're not overwhelmed. Now, I can't give you any solid review of the game, and to be honest, reviewing an early access game is just not the way to go. When you get your hands on Manor Lords, there's assets missing, there's stuff that's not implemented yet, all this stuff, and that's fine. But if we're at this level of game in just early access, I cannot wait for what the full game's launch is going to look like. So if that's all you wanted to know, please feel free to shut the video down and get back to continuing <laughs> counting down the days until early access launches. I'll be rolling out an entire series of beginner guides and helpful breakdowns of mechanics as the game does not have a real tutorial right now, so be on the lookout for those. Before you head out, please don't forget to like, comment, or subscribe if this video helped you, as those things do have a huge impact on my channel. Lastly, if you want to support the channel, you can purchase Manor Lords via my Nexus store when it goes live on the 26th. You can find the link in the description below but you'll get a steam key directly from the developer the purchase button won't go active until the actual launch but please always do what's best for you in your wallet well, let's get started here on whether or not manor lords is worth the hype so booting the game up let's just immediately jump into new game to kind of show off what the beginning looks like so right now we have this portrait system and naming system you can type in and do whatever you want the guy's named cunts oh it's a, it's a manor name generator but you just choose the portrait and that represents your character and then you can go ahead and make your coat of arms. And the coat of arms is actually a really big portion of medieval society. And originally they were kind of used as a way to distinguish who was good and not good, or I guess who was on one side and who was on another. Less so of like a, hey, this is the heraldry of this family and so on and so forth. The uh, earliest forms of coat of arms were traced back to the Normans and they were used in the invasion of England. Kind of a distinguishing factor between, hey, this is... Uh, the Normans invading, and these are the non-Normans on, on the side. But a little bit of history that you probably didn't need to know. But you have a lot of really cool symbols that you can choose from, and you can have a lot of fun with this, you know, like, oh, some Petalunas. Um, you can just go crazy with this. You can make a number of different instances. Um, and then you've got your background. And there's, there's a bunch of different naming mechanics for a lot of this, and you've got, um, I think those are called your scansions, your, your es escutions, I can't remember. Uh, but they're fields. These are the fields A, B, C, D, and your dimidations here. Order of uh, old, an older form of marshalling, combining two coats of arms into one. So, uh, dimidation was usually used as people would get married. They would combine sometimes their coats of arms depending on certain situations. But you can have a lot of fun customizing all these little things, or you can just press this button and you load a custom one that you've made. There's a, there's an actual cutout that you can use and you just put a PNG in there. I, I had a real old coat of arms that I made years ago using the uh, the Space Wolf Lehman Rust coat of arms, but I just put it in here to see how it would fit and I didn't do the best job sizing it, but you just put a PNG into the specific folder right here, tells you exactly how to do it and boom. So you can see right out the gate, you have a lot of really cool customization that you can have a lot of fun with in this game. And I think that it's kind of like a character creator in an RPG. You're going to spend a lot of time doing this and you're going to spend a lot of time just kind of getting lost in it. And it's really fun because then you can go, okay, yeah, I like this one. Let's just go ahead and save it. So you can maybe work on a couple and then load the one you want. Like I've got one of my characters I got right now is kind of made them like a black Templar from Warhammer. I just did this. I did this and I just did like real easy. Just did something like that. I was like, cool, boom, that'll, that'll do for like uh, my first playthrough. 
And then after we do that, we jump already into our scenarios. And we've got three scenarios. Uh, this is pretty much, hey, don't deal with any combat. This has got a mix between combat and no combat. And this is, hey, it's going to be a lot of combat. <clears throat> and then you've got template difficulties. So basically, there's only one map right now. You choose the scenario template. And when you jump into the game on the 26, I'd recommend maybe this one or this one. Um, and then the nice thing is you have all these different little things that you can just cater and tweak right out of the gate. Default is the way you're probably going to want to go, but you can also just go with relaxing and make it so that you have less raids. In fact, that you have no raids. Uh, random ba uh, bandit camp spawn limit three. You can do all these little things right out the gate to kind of customize your experience into the actual game on your first foray or go hard in the paint and go challenging you get no armaments you get standard supplies all sorts of stuff here that makes it a lot more difficult and way more raids which actually are really rough but either way you can see that this game just immediately offers you a ton of ways to play and i don't even know what this more coming soon ai city building is still under work oh i didn't even realize that until i started making this video oh that's gonna be wild but um this setup right now is where you're really going to do all your basic initial stuff, just like you would and you play if you play uh, RimWorld or Frostpunk or any games where you basically set the seed of your game world without actually setting a seed, right? I can't copy and paste a seed. But there's your early customization. Let's jump into some actual gameplay, though. Now, So here's the village I started creating with my stream last week. Richard Shire Hollow. Yes, it's a reference to Dick. But either way, you can see here that we have a small little bustling town. And this game comes down to a number of kind of production. Go to construction here and we've got our gathering, we've got our mining, our logistics, our residential, farming, industry, trade, administration, the typical kind of stuff that you would expect from this style of game. But what we really get here too is a really fun way to make this game not the kind of just geometric the word I'm thinking of, but every time you approach a lot of these games, it's like, oh, it's built in a grid. It's a grid, it's a grid. Medieval villages were not like that. Majority of the time, a medieval village was a long series of, um, not huts, but um, buildings that were along a main thoroughway, a main road. The King's Road is what this game is using in this example. And then off would be stuff like a church or the main manor. And then off much further into the distance, you would get a bunch of fields. And those fields are what the serfs would manage and cater for their liege lord. The serf was kind of a glorified slave, as it were. They weren't necessarily 100% owned product, but they were still pretty close to it. And this game kind of encapsulates that in, that in the sense that I don't really need to have these very set geometric shapes. And what's cool about this is I go ahead and press R and I've got this road builder. And I'm not, why would a road builder be a cool portion of a game? I don't know why, but it's a really fun portion of this one. So I can go ahead and make a road like this if I want. Go ahead and turn this down. I can go ahead and make a real simple square road. Boom. I can do that if I want. Or I can click this, I can hold down control and I can increase the curvature. This isn't like a major feature, but it's going to become something, trust me. And we can kind of have some fun and make a road that's like dynamic and the way that the roads actually worked. And it wasn't just like some weird shape that's like kind of fitting roughly the way something is. But now I've got this weird shape right here. Let's go ahead and just put like another road right here. Quick little path, pathy poo. We've created that. So now I'm going to go over to residential. And what I like about this game is... It's not just, let me place this building a bunch of times over. It's got this little thing that says flexible plot. So I click this and I can kind of map out. This direction shows me where the front of the houses are going to be. I can kind of map out. Let's just do this way. Uh, let's go right there. I can kind of map out how I want this entire plot to be. And it can show me right here, this is going to create five burgage slots. And I can see here that those burger slots are going to have expansion. So if I look at these, it shows me, oops, here, I'll, I'll do this. This locks it in place. Uh, we'll do right there. No, I wanted, this isn't the right one. There it is. This shows me that I've got one, two, three, four slots, but I've got two expansion slots and I've got all these back here to make things like vegetable gardens, or I can make individual uh, little specific artisan crafts locations to turn this entire house into, hey, that's cool, um, a specific focus. Or you know what? I just kind of want this to be one massive or two massive slots. Well, there you go. You can kind of 
really custom build out how this thing is done. And I love this concept for the game because it makes creating your village very interactive and customizable. And it's not just, listen, I'm going to make a road and I'm going to make a whole grid of buildings. Can you do that? Yeah, you definitely can. I could have absolutely done that, taken the road curvature out and customized this to make it a kind of grid like you're driving through the San Fernando Valley in Southern California. If you've ever been there, there's iPhone repair shops in every fucking corner. But what I like about this is it makes the game feel alive. I feel like I'm actually playing a medieval town versus just playing some simulator where everything just kind of exists on a grid. So in this little instance here, I've created my town around this kind of central marketplace. And the marketplace is done in the same exact way. I created this whole entire location. You can see the rough outline here. And that is the marketplace. And this can be done even further. If I go to farming and I go to head and do this with my fields, fields too have a whole bunch of overlays. Okay. I've got emmer fertility, which is for my wheat, flax, barley, rye. I can see how this whole thing works here. And you can see I have existing fields that I've already set up right now that are kind of my focus for wheat. This is predominantly my emmer fields. I made them probably a little too damn large, but you can see that I created the outline for the roads first for the fields to exist within them. And then I basically did this, right? I went and clicked here and down here and over here and then up there to make one field. Then I'm going to do this. Let's do actually right here. And it kind of snaps to the road, which is cool. And then down here. So now I've used the space to make two fields, but I could just as easily make four fields in this space, whatever I want to do. So this makes the game feel alive and it really makes it feel like you're custom building out these locations and just simply stuff like the construction. Of this is very fun. And one thing you'll really realize is the marketplace is very central to the lifeblood of the entire kind of a socioeconomic split of your entire well, economy. So you really need to worry about the market's placement because your supply and demand, it shows you all right, well, I can't reach these houses. I can reach that house with the red and green denotations. In a future save, I create another marketplace down here. But you'll learn a lot of trial and error playing this game by simply kind of going through the crafting system or the building system and realizing, oh, okay, I don't want to build things like that because now my forager has to go so far over here to the storehouse to drop off all the goods. Then the storehouse brings them over here to the marketplace and sell. You learn by playing what things are better, more centrally located. And I think that that's been one of the most rewarding things of playing the game so far is, yeah, sure, it doesn't have a very well blown out tutorial, but it does have a system that makes me want to discover how these things overlap and how they interact with each other. And that's been one of the biggest boons of playing. Is, is the music too loud? The music feels like it's bumping over here. And then you can kind of really jump into the nested portion of this when it comes to our production. So let's jump into that section. Coming over here to our fields, we can see that they are going to be plowed. <laughs> and right now we're set up to do wheat. It's going to yield 10. And then that wheat will become grain. And that grain can become flour. And I can turn that flour into... Um, other resources. I'm building right now a windmill on, in, on this save. We're going to jump to a further advanced save. But the windmill is going to take the grain that is that comes from the wheat field, and then that grain is going to be turned into flour. Then the windmill, after it's done that, I will take the communal ovens to take the flour and then produce bread. So you can see how a lot of these systems nest themselves into one another. The logging camp produces logs or timber for this example, which is then used for coming over here to the saw pit to create a bunch of planks or those planks or uh, uh, those logs can be converted over here into fuel or firewood. So a lot of what exists in this game doesn't stand on its own. It's all part of a system that that kind of always evolves. And one of the things I have a problem with when it comes to a lot of these city builders is okay, am I going to build something that becomes obsolete? And I, and I worry about that. It kind of gives me this weird kind of analysis paralysis when it comes to deciding what to make and where to put it. So I'm like, okay, do I put this here knowing I'm going to knock it down later? Is this like 
oh, hey, here's a mining camp, but in, in two more technology jumps, you get a strip mining camp and it's all this thing here and you blast mine and such. Not that way in this game. Everything leans into something. And I love that because you don't feel like you're wasting a resource that's something that you're gonna just destroy. It's all gonna come back around. And it just kind of makes everything in this game very connected, like I've been talking about. That's like it's a serious situation. But I, I love that that all these things kind of lean into themselves. And then all this can then be helped with this ox. Well, it's a small stable now, but it was a hitching post. This is the first thing you start off with in the game as a hitching post, which I've upgraded to a small stable. And those ox are in some serious situations right now. But all these things are then leveraged by the stable that then brings the timber everywhere and it, and it transports planks and all this stuff to bring, uh, either you have people at your storehouse dropping all these things in here to store them or people at your granary that are gonna go grab all of the food. So all these systems that exist that are all part of your society are then being stored in these locations that then are the, brought over here to your marketplace that are then sold off to the people that are in these houses. So. And this is what I mean by the logistics and all of the resources in this game are part of a very large interconnected system. And it makes it very fun and very interesting because you're always kind of wondering what the next step in that chain is. Take, for example, here, this is the flax field. Oh, we're saving. Um, the flax field here is, well, creating flax. And if you've ever played a game like Ultima Online, like I did and spent an inordinate amount of time tailoring, you know that flax is the beginning for linen um, or at least yarn. So if I come over here to construction and we'll go to industry can come over here to the weaver shop workers use wool to produce yarn yeah right, right it's flax to produce linen okay i was right so you have okay cool that flax is going to become linen and that linen can become clothes and that is where it comes into another portion of a nested system within this game let's <coughs> let's cough on the microphone let's go over here so now we have our burgage slot and these burgage slots are where all of our peasants and serfs live but in these things, you can actually specialize the people that live in this house. So I can say, you know what? We want to focus on bows. So now it converts all inhabitants to artisans, locking them from being assigned to other jobs. Because I can just willy-nilly assign people to, hey, you know what? I've got eight families in this society. Let's put one of them over here into the trading post. Or let's put more people over here into the farm. Whatever it is, you can just kind of assign them as you wish. But as soon as you unlock these or build one of these, you start to take all of the other resources that you've created as a byproduct of what, three or four nested levels of production to then create another resource. So we talked about linen, enables the production of shoes, or where, no, 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 there it is. Uh, enables production of clothes and cloaks and gambesons from the tailor's workshop. So you can lean into all these really fun directions by making certain locations specialized. You can say, hey, you know what? I'm gonna have all these houses right here be my just generic workers that are gonna do whatever. But I'm gonna make like an artisan's quarter where I just make like, okay, let's, let's just go ahead and do this as an example. Let's just make, okay, this is my artisan's quarter. So all the people that inhabit these houses are going to be artisans so that I know anyone that I expand from this point on and these locations, they are set. I don't need to worry about trying to, oh crap, I overextended myself into artisans. I don't have enough craftspeople to do the basic jobs around the, the village, whatever it is. So having that kind of flexibility, but also that kind of resource management, right? Like People are a constant managing resource that you're going to assign and unassign to different jobs to help build whatever it is, but then you kind of lose them and put them into this specifically. Okay. Enables production of war bows, but now I can create uh, archers with my militia. We're going to get to military in a little bit here. So you can see that this has got all these really fun and cool systems that are attached to it. And it's not just simply like, okay, I made the logging camp. Now we've got this resource covered. Boom. What's our next resource? Okay. We've got that resource covered. Boom. It's more that each resource can graduate into a bigger form or bigger step in a larger production line to produce more byproducts. But you've put all this time into all these different production methods. You've gotten enough resources. Now it's time to make a manor. Now I talked about this, right? Manors are kind of the central point of most of these medieval towns. They're all built around some sort of manor, which now brings us to our castle fucking planner. Now the castle planner is a little buggy right now because you can place roads and those roads help to kind of outline certain things, but you cannot do it in this 
mode for some reason. It actually just places a wall, but that's just, again, it's part of early access, ignore those little things. Now, what I like about this screen here is you get to get pretty granular with this. So here's just our castle to start off with. That's our initial kind of circle. Um, and we can make walls that will go the distance around this whole thing. And I can, just like the roads, add curvature to them. Let's go ahead and do like that. Like a this and like a that. You can go ahead and just kind of do these things. Go away. And then when we come to this, the game will automatically generate like a little gatehouse around. You can press this and it constructs it. Now, it doesn't really construct it. It kind of adds it to a queue. You have to have the resources to construct it. It's actually, it's pretty expensive. But then you get stuff like the garrison tower, which is a cool little thing you can either add here or add directly into the wall, whatever you want to do here. And then you've got the tax office, which doesn't do anything right now. It's just kind of like a, they said it says right there, cosmetic only under rework. So that does exist. I'm just going to place it just to place it. I'll sit right there, whatever. Then you've also got these outer towers, which provide garrison space. Garrison units and villagers shoot projectiles at approaching enemies. So I can go ahead and place this here and look what it does to the circle. It makes it much larger. So we can have this kind of, I'm just placing things right now, but eventually, you know, we could probably do like this and like actually have walls that would connect all this, but I'm just trying to make my point. Eventually you could have your entire thing covered. Now I've been trying to decide or find out, and I, I don't know if it's implemented it yet or not, what this circle exactly means. Um, I assume it means that it's, hey, this is the region that the garrison covers and will protect. Anything that steps in this zone is gonna be a shot by these things. And I would think that this would actually have prevented my raids from happening, but it doesn't. But again, that might just be part of a system that doesn't exist in the game yet. And then I could connect these things if I wanted to. Like, you know, like do this and then blah, 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 you know. Obviously, I wouldn't have a ramshackle click around like that. But still, you get an idea that you can really have a lot of fun making this castle. And what's cool, too, is, you know what? I made this wall like this. I don't like it. Let's do that instead. There's so much granularity to just the simple production in this game that I'm like, how do games not have this already? Like, how do, how is this, like... Cutting edge. There's a single developer for this game that's contracted out everything. He contracted out the music generation, which is amazing. He's contracted out all the 3D animations, like all of it. It's 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 awesome because, okay, you know what? Let's look at this again. Um, let's actually add this here. Okay, cool. Now we have another post, and we can do stuff like that, or maybe we'll do another post there and there, and we can make this expand to this way. And this just becomes a lot more fluid of a system rather than, okay, I've created it. Now, ugh, I messed up. Let me completely reset everything and go again. It just makes for a really cool way to go about this process where I don't feel so shoehorned into every little thing I'm doing like most strategy games do. You make something in a strategy game, you screw up a placement, your hand twitched a little bit while trying to place something and it, and it completely swapped directions. It just becomes a bit of a headache. Even the manor itself, I can go ahead and move it. You know, like I can just change all these things and all these points and then commit when I've got the resources and everything ready. The, the game will just build the manor as it is until you have the resources to do all the, you know, all these extemporary things that you added in. Just kind of depends on what you're going to do. But what I think is kind of cool here is you can have a lot of fun adding certain buildings into this kind of manner. And I'm making a beginner's guide on how to kind of set up your town to begin with and all this stuff. And I think that the way that the game kind of wants you to do this is put your storehouse and granary within the manor's limits to protect it because that's kind of the first things that, that raiders go for. So it's very kind of true to form in that the majority of, of the storage for most medieval granaries and storehouses and stuff like that would actually be within the confines of a walled manor uh, um, castle, quote unquote. They, they have different progressions, right? A Mott and Bailey is kind of the original one created by the Normans throughout the majority of... Um, uh, England, but either way, those storehouses would actually be in here, actually, usually against the wall. The, the wall would be a, a large walled palisade, and the uh, wall would have a little kind of almost like a little almost like this, and that would be your storehouse, stuff like that. So, I think the game actually wants you to put those in there, and it's like that would 
that kind of stands to reason that I've created this area over here for my storehouse, my granary, which I would probably have built the manor around had I known. So again, this is part of a system that you can kind of learn and go, oh, you know what? I actually screwed up the placement of that. Let me go ahead and, and, and change it entirely, which I really love. You're not so locked in. Now that isn't 100% true though. Like if I close this, um, if I wanna move this livestock trading post, I have to actually demolish it. There's a few buildings that you can just press this button and actually relocate, which is really cool. But by and large, most buildings that are substantial, like you have to actually demolish them. But the nice thing is, unless it's a burgage slot, or maybe like a lot of some of the things that have upgrades, destroying it and repopulating it somewhere else is not that big of a deal, especially in the early portions of the game. So I kind of like that like non-permanence to a lot of these options while you're learning and building out your city and going, oh, oh, okay, or do that over there. You could even like sit there and go, well, let's go ahead and do this here. And that would actually knock down all these trees. So you could you can actually kind of like you're not so constrained to the locations that you're in. That's going to cause a huge animal migration. But that shows you the castle planner. Let's jump forward to a save that I'm a little bit further in the game with to show off some other other uh, um, content. So we've got some enemies that are making their way towards our camp. Let's show off a little bit of combat. But before we do that, let me show you off. Show you off. Let me show off how you can actually customize your retinue that's been created by your manor. So after your manor has been created, and my manor has been created, but there's a bug right now that if you load into a game where you already have a manor, it appears like this. And it's mainly also too because they're building out the walls for everything. But if you have a manor created, you have a retinue. Now in medieval times, usually someone who was a noble, uh, someone who owned land would also have men at arms. Men at arms were actually a large portion of your fighting force that was directly derivative of your nation. Uh, more often than not, the composition of an actual army in the Middle, Middle Ages was men-at-arms, large portion militia, and then a ton of mercenaries. Majority of battles in, in the Middle Ages actually had um, large people, large amounts of soldiers routing because they were they were either militia or mercenaries that were like, I don't want to die for this. Let's just go make money somewhere else. So that's actually what happened. And most people were actually taken hostage to men-at-arms or nobles because they could just be ransomed either back to their noble or to their liege lord. So when you get a retinue, you can have a lot of fun with this. I'm going to pause this because those, let's see how far away those bandits are. Yeah, they're pretty close. Um, that retinue here, we get to have some fun and press this button. And from here, we get to have a lot of fun customizing another portion of the game. I can just simply choose each one of my members of my retinue right now. I've only got 12 and uh, you know, they're a little scraggly looking, um, but I can choose different armor upgrades. I can choose different body. So I, oh, okay. You know, this guy's got a chainmail halberd. Uh, is that brigandine? Uh, it looks like just a surcoat over chainmail. Another big old surcoat here. So you can, you can have a lot of fun just kind of choosing this. You can say, okay, I want all my guys to kind of have the same general look. Um, I can change their weapons. So I can have like a Volgier or I can have a, a halberd or a bardiche, whatever it is that I'm going to want to swap off here. Different helmets here too, right? Like the kind of Norman style of chainmail helmet where that comes off over his, his face. Um, uh, that is a bassinet without the face mask. You have a lot of really cool options here. And then you can even specialize them. So, you know, maybe this guy is going to be using um, it was his pole arm, his pole axe, whatever this is. Um, and I can say, oh, this is what it is. This is a, he's going to focus on these expertise. And we don't know what these expertises do. Of course, he's all say work in progress. We have no inclination of what they are. And then I can actually upgrade their armor, pay the full price to import the armor set for this retainer, or pay half price buying from local armorers. The treasury, the treasury funds will get tra uh, transferred to the regional wealth. And you have all these different things. And I can use this from the artisans that I created. Again, this is jumping back into the nested system of the game, right? Oh, I now have artisans that are creating armor for me because I have blacksmith and armorers. Boom, this all goes to my ret my retinue, my retainers. I can recruit more men at arms for 50 uh, silver or gold. I don't know what it is, a piece. Recruit ministerials, ministerial OS. Promote one of your citizens to your retinue. Locked in early access, of course. But then they also have a kind of like predilections, right? Notorious gambler. Acts arrogant and privileged, afraid of horses. And I can choose their armor too and what they look like as far as this goes. Like, okay, is this, what kind of shield are we going with? A standard style of like heater shield, 
um, a little buckler. We're going to go with the shield that you'd probably use while jousting. All these cool things and then what that looks like. So you have a lot of really cool customization options within it. And I love it. I think it's a really cool portion of the game too because it makes... what What's cool about this is you're playing a sim, you're playing like a city builder, and then you make this manor and you feel like you've just stepped up a, a certain step, right? The manor's now created, you're working towards a castle, you have a retinue, you're a budding lord in the Middle Ages. You've got either, you're either a bear, you're probably a baron at this stage, whatever the hell it is, a baron or a duke or a grand duchy, whatever it is. And this kind of just leans into all that fun. But let's put this all together and let's show off some combat and how that combat system works too. These bad guys are getting close to our territory. Let us summon up some militia and have some fun. So you can see they're really, they're not far at all. And they're, they're actually, it, the amount of time it takes to set this up is pretty quick. So they're about probably going to come in this straight line. And they're typically going to go for my granary and my, my uh, storehouse. So let's go ahead and click this button. And it shows us our army panel. So we can bring up our retinue and we're definitely going to bring them up, right? So we'll go ahead and rally them. I'm just bring them right there. So now the game is going to send them to that location. But we can also create units based off of the supply of armaments that we have. So if I work on making all these other items, I can make all these other things. And I can also press this button and hire a bunch of mercenaries. And this shows me what I would get. Light mercenary infantry, right? Or mercenary spearmen and archers. Now, unfortunately, I only have spears and um, shields. The game just gives you that from the start. But you can see I could have had... Uh, footmen here, I could have had pole arms, I could have had archers if I had made these respective items. But I just have militia or uh, spears, so we're going to go ahead and press this button. And it tells you right here, you know, mayor villages will be villagers will be evenly distributed between all militia units, and they will try to find the required equipment. Now, what's cool here too is you read this part while the maximum quality of body armor and helmet depends on the villagers' residential level, so the families that this pulls from. If it pulls from any of my level two burgage slots, they're going to be well, they're going to be better equipped than my ones that pull from level one slots. So there's kind of a natural progression for your militia because they're coming from like, not higher rent locations, but <laughs> I mean, like they're coming from a better slot, more or less. After bringing all necessary equipment home, the unit recruits are marked as ready to rally. So let's go ahead and press this button and press this button right here. And th these guys come out pretty quickly. And... I've got two locations here that are level two. So these guys will put better, these these will put out better units, more or less, better equipped units. Let's go ahead and press normal speed. I hope I didn't do this too late. I don't think I did. And this just shows me we can command them. Yeah, you can see they're all scurrying about. So what this now, what the, what the game kind of comes down to combat wise, and which is again, kind of interesting to what I talked about earlier. Majority of combat in the middle ages was not to the death. You didn't have 50,000 soldiers fighting 50,000 soldiers and there was 20 left. It was 50,000 soldiers would fight 50,000 soldiers and the majority of the, of the ones who lost would flee. And that's kind of what we're going to get here because the game comes down to stances, morale, and fatigue and also effectiveness. So we're going to take our spear militia here and let's pause this again so we, I can exposit. Take our spear militia, and we can see that I've got missile alerts. So they're going to put their shields up if they start taking uh, range fire. They've got balance where they just kind of, kind of do a little bit of both. Or I can sit there and put them in stand your ground, which is really cool. Soldiers try to stand their ground. Defense is doubled, but attack frequency is halved. Or push forward. Soldiers try to push forward with their full force. And there's this last one over here called give ground. Slowly pushes the formation line backward, luring the enemy to follow. I love this. And I love that this is just like, again, early access levels of, of, of playing around with this. I, I don't know if we're eventually going to have cavalry. I've seen that they were, they have, uh, teased a lot of siege equipment, but it'll be used exclusively for sieges. From what I understand, there's no like, Oh, here's a, here's a catapult in the middle of a field battle. That's not a thing. It's uh, only, uh, what's his name? Who did gladiator did that. Um, but run to positions, hold and the disband unit, the typical kind of stuff that you would see. So let's go ahead and drag out and we can see how, where they're going to form the kind of line. If you play Total War Warhammer or any other kind of Total War game, you're very familiar with this system. I think every RTS uses it for the most part. Let's go with like a four deep line, right? And by four, I mean three. So we'll do that. Now we'll kind of take the brunt of the force that's coming this way. And we'll use our retinue here as kind of like a, like an anvil. So we'll kind of bring them over here and kind of hide them. And we'll go ahead and press play. And they'll kind of make their formations. 
And we're going to see too their effectiveness right now, right? They're moving. So their effectiveness is not going to be super, super splendid. And we're going to put them in. This thing should, they, they should just hit this guy dead on. So in the trees, you can't really see them, right? But I purposely kind of chose this very slight, very slight hill. In fact, I'll kind of move them up a little bit more. It will wrap around and then we'll go stand your ground. So now this unit's going to stand their ground. And it's going to increase their defense capabilities, right? They're not going to be the most... This guy's just going to have an issue trying to have a dance-off with the front ranks there. But they're not going to be as good as fighting. And you can see that green bar shows their their, uh, their overall fatigue. The top one is their morale. And it shows me what stance they're in and their overall effectiveness. And this effectiveness is going to grow because they are in a standard ground position. They're, they're kind of not digging in. It's not trench warfare, but you get the point. We'll kind of get this to speed up a little bit. Hopefully... I, oh, I messed that up. That's okay. It's okay. We're fine. We're fine. Everything's fine. Nothing's going to happen bad in this video that I've created for YouTube. That is going to surely be the downfall of my very channel. Okay. Just kind of hit these guys dead on through it. So you double click them. They'll, they'll jump to push forward, jump right in, and we'll have our other guys do the same. Originally, I had done this on stream, and I just kind of pincer attacked, and it worked like a charm. But not this time. So we just jump right into combat here. Their effectiveness is 34 versus our 72, and our uh, and I can kind of hover over this. Let's go ahead and pause to show off. Um, I can hover over this to see. Okay, our effectiveness of retinue is 136. We've got the high ground here. We don't have as much cohesion, but we're still pretty linked up, so we're good. Um, but they've got terrible cohesion by by uh, um, I don't know what I'm trying to say. They have terrible cohesion, so their experience is higher, but the army power balance is higher. We have more units. Their fatigue is not too terrible, but they've got the low ground and they're surrounded, right? We've, we put them on all sides. So their morale is already going to start tanking quickly and their effectiveness is real shit versus ours at 76, 72, and 136. So let's go ahead and let's take a look at my other unit here. Uh, fatigue is low. Cohesion's a little wonkopotamus, right? We've got some guys back here and some guys in the front. So the units that are, that are more compact and stacked up on top of each other like like we originally had if they had just hit us head on our cohesion would be good would be able to get have the higher ground and all sorts of good things but because we're like this it's gonna throw us into a little bit of disarray let's go ahead and just kind of fix that now and also a cool thing you should know about like combat in the middle and ancient times it wasn't some big massive melee where things would press together there was usually a front line fighting and then back supporting lines that would come and swap out units if there was a hole that would open up they would come and step in it was not just what we see in movies where it's just like oh let's all just have a cluster now you can see that this unit was about 18 strong and it's at 12 now we've killed six people and my retinue over here is still looking pretty strong a little worried about them i hope they don't hope they don't lose anyone and we're winning. We're, we're, we're pushing them back here. Our three militias effectiveness isn't too awesome because of that cohesion's all wonky. But oh, we've done it. We won. They're fleeing. Oh, dude, just double tap that guy. What a go, retinue. And now they're off. They're, they're, they're not going to rally and come back to us. They're, they're, they're going to route off the table, as it were. And that shows us now that we have completely won. We, we just won that battle. But what's fun now about this and things that we don't talk about when it comes to conflict of any kind of like video game is that there are corpses and those corpses have to be dealt with. So you have to make corpse pits for your enemies and the church will pick up any of your own troops that have fallen and dig and bury them in their own church. I'll show you that when I jump forward to uh, my actual save. But th that brings us back to our, our, our uh, unit formation here. And you can see this guy comes from a good house. This guy comes from like a ramshackle house. You can see that that kind of direct difference in the way that their armaments look and everything. He looks like, he doesn't look like he has a gambeson on, but it definitely has a little uh, padded quaff, as it would call. Some people call it a coif. It's called a quaff. This guy's got a wicker basket on his fucking head with some, some metal straps on it. So you can see that this comes down to a really fun bit of combat. And this is just base level, basic bitch combat. This is not anything really cool and awesome. I don't have a bunch of archers doing a bunch of really cool stuff. I'm barely using any kind of real tactics. And even then my tactics fell through the roof, but we still were able to pull out the dub. Let's now jump forward to kind of give you my overall thoughts on everything. So that kind of brings us to a close here, right? 
You can see my whole entire really cool sprawling city here as I grow more things, as I add windmills to the, to the works here. We start to make bread. We have our little sheep pastures as we try to build into those. And there's a little bit more on that. I'm going to say in a little bit. We have our manor, which is budding with its cool little walls and kind of hodgepodge back here into the woods. We have our growing uh, civic center and all sorts of fun things around this marketplace. And we talked about this just a little bit ago, but in my original save, one of my retinue men died. So he gets buried over here in this church. You can see right there, a dead body. <laughs> but for all those bandits that we killed, we created a corpse pit. So now the game is going to go grab all those dudes and just kind of chuck them into this corpse pit over here. And they just kind of get thrown into the into whatever. You can actually remove that guy there who's who's working at the corpse pit. Same thing over here at the church we do. Okay, good. Um, and the game just really kind of comes down to having a lot of fun with a lot of these systems. And I'm deliberately cho uh, choosing the one where I don't have to deal with tons of combat right now, but that is definitely going to be a big driving force of this game. I wanted to learn how these, how the town system works because it's a huge portion of the game too. You can't have combat without the actual necessity and byproduct to create that combat, right? Using these burgage slots to make people that are going to do boyers workshops or armors workshops or blacksmith workshops. And those are really fun portions of all of this. And um, this all then links into expanding your villages and your towns. You click this button and then there is like an RPG system that is linked to the development of this. Now I can sit there and say, okay, I want this thing to work to focus more on the farming portion of this, which I've done. I focus on heavy plows and I've made it so that sheep breeding exists. So all of you that are Welsh is probably stoked about that. Or I could jump over here and create other forms of food production like beekeeping and apiaries, or this kind of helps me out with passive income of meat, or go down here and really stoke into um, the military and the armor production of things. Okay, a charcoal kiln, which then asks me to upgrade to deep mines or basic armor making, and then into advanced armor making and master armor making. Or maybe we go into the more trade and commerce and jump into foreign suppliers, which give us firewood and food carts, or trade logistics, which establishing a new trade route always costs a max of 25 regional wealth. So there's a fun RPG system underneath the hood of all this. And then I've got a policy system that is not a hundred percent like Frostpunk, but it's something kind of similar in that I can kind of make concessions. Okay, hey, citizens skip every fifth meal, but and that reduces food consumption, but now we decrease our approval. Or wild animals on rich deposits breed pr twice as fast at the cost of fifty percent reduced yields from crops. So it's like, yeah, now I'm I'm getting more meat, but I'm getting less crops as a result. And we've got other ones that are locked here. You can see these are the ones that are in work in progress right now, but it's a really cool kind of uh, system that will be unlocked as you jump into more and more things. And then there's a production tab that I have no idea what it does. Uh, but you can see that there's a lot more going here. And our, 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 our village here will upgrade itself. Next settlement level is a large village. Each level gets you a development point that you can use to specialize your town and make it more efficient. So once I upgrade three of these burgage slots to level two, it, I'm going to jump up to a large village and I'll progress further and further. It, it goes like village and then city if you kind of think of the overall progression of things. But I am loving every second of it. And I was liking it when I started out. I was like, oh, cool. Let's make a, make a field here. And I, I didn't even go into this. Like there's crop rotations that's just built into the game. So the game can naturally crop rotate. I don't have to actually kind of manage it every, every season, which is a really fun part of all this. I can choose like field priorities and stuff like that and building priorities and all these things that exist within these games as it is. But I just think that this game takes a lot of those systems and it really makes it fun and accessible without it being so mechanic heavy that you're like, oh, God, I need a PhD to play this. I mean, don't get me wrong. I love my Crusader Kings 3, but I could never really get into Victoria 3 because it just had, it was like, it was like a Victorian era market simulator for me. And I am not a smart human being. I'm dumb. And so it's hard for me to jump into systems like that. This scratches an itch for the medieval kind of gameplay that I love. And I'm clearly very enraptured with uh, medieval history. And this leans into a lot of those fun directions. And I can do a lot of really cool things here by taking a look at my marketplace coverage. Okay, my marketplace covering all these. Okay, now they can all upgrade. There's a lot of really cool little things that I can do to make this game feel like a lot more complex than it really is. Like a lot of these systems feel like, oh man, dude, I'm not gonna understand this. But once you jump in, those systems unra unravel for you at a rate where you go, 
Okay, I built this. Okay, I need water access. Got it. Church access. Okay, got it. Uh, well, how do I get these things? Okay, fuel. Well, what's fuel? Oh, that's firewood? Okay, I can get firewood. Or food? Okay, what's food? Okay, meat or veggies or, or berries. Okay, cool. Or even like birds. Got it. Um, or clothing stalls. Okay, well, what's, what's clothing? Uh, I think it shows over here somewhere. Well, either way. Leather counts as clothing and leather you get from your hunting camp. So you kind of put two and two together very quickly, even though the game doesn't lay them out for you. And even then, a lot of this stuff, you hover over these little question marks, it gives you somewhat of a breakdown of what it is. So you can see that there's a lot of stuff going in this game. And there's a lot of complexity, but that complexity is at least layered enough that you're not overwhelmed. So guys, let me know in the comment section below, how are you feeling about Manor Lords? Are you stoked to get your hands on the game on the 26th? Are you waiting? for the game to hit more of a solid state right now, right? It's definitely an early access. We only have one map. We're just gonna have some fun with what we've got. Um, and if you play the demo, it's not that much different than the demo. It's just more fleshed out. There's more to it. There's a little bit more that you can play with, but by and large, you're just kind of in the same overall system. But what exact, what things have you heard or seen that you're more excited about? Like, hey, you know, I really can't wait to jump into this system and so on and so forth. There are tons of things in this game. And I'm really excited to show this game off. And I'm really excited, too, to see how the development comes after the 26th. But as always, guys, thank you so much for watching here today. Have a good one and take care. Oh, oh, oh wait, before you take care, press this button and go into visit mode and walk around your whole entire city. And then once you've done that, have a good one and take care.